Across the public safety continuum, first responders from law enforcement, fire, and EMS, 911 communications, and crisis systems work together daily to care for community members experiencing a mental health crisis. So what's being done across Arizona to ensure first responder mental well-being? Uh, from prevention to intervention, how has the tide shifted in the first responder world to support mental well-being for first responders? So those are the questions we're going to ask today as we're joined by a panel of experts from across Arizona who devote their time to the field of public safety and caring for first responders. I'm Matt Eckhoff with Camino Te Community Consulting on behalf of the Vitalist Health Foundation as we continue to take a look at Arizona's first responder and mental health integration efforts. First off, I just want to share a note of care to anyone watching or listening today uh, to our conversation. We're going to discuss mental health topics such as suicide, depression, anxiety, and obviously these are sensitive topics, but um, topics that are so necessary to discuss uh, in the pursuit of destigmatizing support and care for mental health challenges. So if you or someone you know needs support, 988, the National Suicide and Crisis Lifeline is available 24-7. Joining us today uh, to discuss their work to improve first responder mental well-being, we have a lineup of folks who are no stranger to the world of public safety, and the unique challenges first responders face on a daily basis. And we have Director Sharon McDonough from the Tucson Public Safety Communications Department. Uh, Director McDonough has served the Tucson region as a deputy chief in the Tucson Fire Department, and now through collaboration with Tucson area communities through centralized dispatch and co-location of crisis service providers within Tucson's 911 system. Next up, we have an emergency medicine and EMS physician who is the EMS Medical Director at the Arizona Department of Health Services Bureau of EMS and Trauma System. That's Dr. Gail Bradley. Uh, has supported initiatives across Arizona to improve outcomes for ill and injured people across the lifespan. Dr. Bradley chairs the Arizona EMS Council and the State Trauma Advisory Board, which guide EMS and trauma policies across Arizona. And Dr. Bradley has been active in the evolution of building access to mental health resources for first responders, through her work with ADHS at the community level and as a leader on the board of emshelp.org. And with about 30 years of experience with the Tucson Police Department, we're joined also by Captain Michelle Pickram. Captain Pickram leads the department's wellness division at Tucson Police Department. She's also a board member of the Arizona Women's Initiative Network. AZWIN was founded with a mission to develop best practice recommendations to Arizona agencies to recruit, retain, and promote qualified women in the law enforcement profession. And last and certainly not least, this morning we have Battalion Chief Matt Shaw from Guardian Medical Transport based in Flagstaff. Guardian is responsible for providing EMS services across approximately 3,300 square miles of Arizona's Northland. Uh, Matt has a background in EMS, wilderness medicine, and public health. BC Shaw serves on the Arizona Department of Health Services EMS Education Standing Committee. He's also supported out-of-hospital cardiac arrest research to support best practices and continues to lead efforts to expand access to mental health wellness resources for EMTs, paramedics, and firefighters across Northern Arizona. We got a lay of the land of who's here around our table. Thank you all for being here today. A little background, we all know this as public safety professionals, but perhaps the general community doesn't realize um, public safety professionals represent a pretty disproportionate um, rate of mental health issues whether it's depression, whether it's anxiety, and unfortunately, the rate of suicide is significantly higher among us. And, and so with that as our introduction, I kind of wanted to give the floor to Dr. Gail Bradley from the Arizona Department of Health Services. Thank you, Matt. You know, I think this is definitely a conversation that started several years ago uh, prior to me coming on at the Department of Health Services. Uh, my predecessor had um, looking at rates of suicide amongst EMS providers in the state and saw, as you mentioned, a much higher rate. And so that started the conversation of what could be done at the bureau level to help raise awareness. And so I've been involved even before my time at the bureau of really kind of bringing together multiple different stakeholder groups to look at, see, identify, and really talk about the problem and the issue. I think number one, if you ignore it, then it kind of adds to the stigma. And so really making this a topic that we wanted to bring forward. Uh, the bureau developed a component of the website uh, really dedicated to res resiliency and wellness and trying to get a list of resources. And we've actually recently uh, started going through that, updating and adding to that as well. Uh, the Bureau is finalizing the final stages of a strategic plan for 2025 through 2030. And one of the things in talking to stakeholders across the state and the listening sessions that I think we had 
uh, well over a thousand participants, overwhelmingly we heard the importance of uh, wellness and resiliency. And so we recognize that our position at the Bureau is to say, we hear that, we want to make sure that uh, we recognize that and really share that information out as part of our strategic plan. Uh, at a statewide level, you know, we are a regulator, uh, but we do a lot of other work outside of just regulation. And so we want to make sure that we also uh, kind of share resources that we may be aware of. So as you mentioned, there's the EMS Help Board uh, that started a Stop the Stigma campaign. Uh, and that campaign has really put out a number of billboards and advertisements to try to get the message that we want to make sure that there isn't a stigma, that we get people to recognize that they need help, they should ask for help. Uh, some of the other uh, things that we've done is really kind of not looking to replace existing resources, but really just to help uh, advertise them per se. We're not endorsing one above another, but recognizing that different providers are going to relate more with one type of resource versus another. Uh, and so this includes things like uh, Firestrong, 100 Club of Arizona. Uh, as you mentioned with 980 in Solari, they do have resources that are specific to EMS providers. Uh, so recognizing that all these resources that are out there uh, at a statewide level, we want to help disseminate some of that information. Now, if we you know jump over, you know we're talking about you know the fire and EMS side. Um, Captain Pickram, can you can you help us educate the community around what's happening in the law enforcement side of things? I I can tell you that um, wellness um, and it's always been um, something that we we look towards, but it is actually shifting to be more of a priority. Um, and you're 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 hearing more chiefs and law enforcement leaders talking about how do we support our employees in in the wellness realm. Uh, the doctor spoke a little bit about the uh, the stigma attached to to suicide. You're you're hearing more openness uh, where it comes to suicide. You know, you had January six. Uh, one of the things that came out of that was where it it is being before it was not considered as a line of duty death. Um, now they're looking at it in that realm. Um, so it it the biggest thing that I can say is is just that the wellness overall wellness of the employee, not just from um, a, a critical incident that might happen at work. Um, it, it's what's going on with your family, what's going on with the, the officer. We've had uh, the early intervention programs. Uh, most, most agencies have those, but even that we're looking at differently because they mainly focus on um, complaints, um, use of force. But now we want to know, why is this person taking all this time off? What is going on in their life that they're taking all this time off? Is it a sick child? Is it a family member? We're looking at the whole person more so than just a particular incident because the whole person, one of the things we say a lot is that the same thing that's going on in the community, the kind of calls that we're responding to, we have those internally, our officers, our communication, our fire department, EMS, we all are facing those things, but then we also have to go out and respond to these things in the public. Or what I am seeing is is that instead of just focusing on specific critical incidents and how do we get them through a critical incident, we're looking at everything that is is involved with. We're looking at the whole person in in essence. And someone in an average person's lifespan, maybe a handful of of moments of of trauma that someone's been exposed to. And we know in this <laughs> realm, on a monthly basis, we're probably experiencing traumatic incidents at a rate much higher. Um, than you know the general population, and so to start pulling back the veil, and you know as you kind of allude to, we're we're all humans. Director McDonough, I wanted to hop back up to you because you've you've spent a number of years working, you know, as a chief fire officer in the Tucson Fire Department, and now you're bringing you know all of that experience together into your work with um, you know Tucson's 911 Center. Can you give us a lay of the land from your perspective of how things are shifting from peer support perspective? Gosh, you know, this is where we all really benefit from each other because when we're going forward with new ideas, you know, city managers and bosses hear the word money attached to that. And our ability to, to kind of um, capitalize off the work of the other industry allows us to collectively come up with something bigger. Uh, Michelle named a couple of things there that the, the law enforcement agencies are doing to protect their people and take care of their people. And we have just kind of gleaned on to some of their work, you know, through a, programs that they're using and then kind of expanding on some of their thought process. Here at 911, we haven't thought of our people in this industry in a really profound way. So we're years behind police and fire recognizing that what our people are exposed to just by uh, on the phone is traumatic. 
And, you know, to, to your point and to Michelle's point there, we have all of our regular stresses in life. And then we go and we see these things or hear these things that are just not normal to hear. You know, you may be exposed to a single deceased person in your life, someone you loved, or maybe you witnessed a car accident, but our folks are witnessing that at an incredible rate. And to walk away from that and say that I'm not harmed by that, plus now I have all of the regular stuff of life, um, we have to recognize that our exposure levels are crazy. There are areas, um, there's an intersection in town where I, I happen to be part of a, a big incident there where a young child passed away. And I think to myself that I'm fine. We think that you know, we're strong, we're built for this. This is what we do. This is our chosen profession. But what I didn't realize is almost five years later, I'm driving in a car one day with my daughter to go to a certain location. And she said, you know, mom, you, you could have just gone that way. Like, why did you go up and around? And what was happening is uh, somewhere in my, my brain, I had decided to avoid that intersection because of the, the past memories and things. So there's little pictures of that all through all of our professions. And, you know, when you're laying in bed at night and you're dealing with that, the idea that we, um, we are all fine has kind of been pushed away with all of this effort and our ability to say, you know what, I'm not fine and I need help. And then our agency's ability to say, we have that ready for you is huge. And it's going to make big differences for all of us. The Tiger Act was put into place a couple years ago to recognize that PTSD is a real thing in police and fire. Um, last October, they added our profession, the Com Center Telecommunicators, to that uh, to recognize that exposure over the phone is also horrible. When you're winning, you know, you're giving CPR instructions to a mom whose six-year-old is dying, um, you don't just hang up and get the next phone call and, and say you're okay. There's an effect there. And our ability to recognize that and say that out loud and just walk up and say, you can't be okay. We know you're not okay. Now what will we do about it, I think, is the next part of the conversation about what actions are we taking after we recognize it to do something about it. Battalion Chief Matt Shaw, um, I want to get your perspective because you're, so you're based in Flagstaff, but you cover a lot of rural territory. What are you seeing from, from your, your perspective of how your folks, um, your peers are being affected by what you do every day? Yeah, I, uh, I think that's a great question. And to echo what some of the other panelists have said, I think uh, since the time that I got into EMS over 15, almost 20 years ago, uh, which I don't like to say too loudly, uh, to now things have changed pretty dramatically. Uh, I think certainly when I came into the industry, um, there was a lot of you come to work no matter what. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're sick. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're uh, mental health sick or or like flu sick. You you show up to work and you you do your job and uh, you, you don't complain about it. And we see a lot of uh, horrible things uh, and that's just the norm. And uh, when you get into this field, that's what you're gonna do. Uh, and I would say that over the last probably three to four years, we've seen a really big shift in that mentality um, where uh, we've really tried to encourage people to be more open uh, and honest about their, their mental health and to seek help, uh, to, to try to destigmatize a lot of what mental health uh, has been for pre-hospital care or pre-hospital medicine in the past. Um, I think one of the the things that's unique for us up here anyway is that you know we're a we're a hospital-based ambulance service, um, which is pretty unique in Arizona. But we run all the 911 calls in our entire area. So uh, we we run with our our brother and sister fire departments, but we cover a much larger area than any of them do. So uh, we really see the whole span of, of, of events that take place within that 3,300 square miles that we cover. And what we've noticed is that typically because we're not a fire base or a, a city municipality based system, we're not really included in a lot of the mental health resources that exist out there. So we're not really included in the Tiger Act. We're not included in the public safety um, act that's national. Um, and so we've really found that we need to, to sort of fend for ourselves and come up with our own solutions to try to help uh, our staff with mental health with mental health issues. Historically, because we are part of a hospital, we were part of the hospital's uh, insurance and mental health program. So when there was issues, you were there was a pathway to contact the behavioral health unit, talk with a counselor. But what we found was that it was very, very difficult to access. And there was a lot of staff stigma to contact someone who we worked with regularly on a on a day-to-day -day basis with, and they didn't want to be seen 
um, sort of interacting with with those folks. And and they and they felt like the care that they were getting wasn't really specific to them. They felt it was more sort of just generic mental health care. Um, and so about a year and a half ago, after um, after the city of Flagstaff and a couple of the other surrounding fire departments had created this partnership with a local mental health um, business in town that specialized, specifically specialized in first responder uh, PTSD and mental health counseling. But I can tell you that it has been unbelievably successful. Um, the We sort of started out with this, this general contract where we, we were going to ask them to provide us X number of of visits a week and X number of visits a month. And what we quickly realized that we we dramatically underestimated the need that was out there. And so we've been able to scale it up rapidly um, to the point where they've had to hire more counselors in order to keep up with the demand. Um, but staff are really, uh, really bought into it. Um, it's something that we talk about around the station, sure. but really just the work to destigmatize it, to share that, you know, I as a leader, uh, after this, this many years in the service, like, I also need mental health and I also go to counseling and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, it doesn't make me any less uh, of a person or less of an EMS professional. Um, if anything, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that it makes me better. Um, and so we've had, we've had a really great response from staff and we've been very grateful to the hospital and the foundation for helping us fund this, this project. And we hope that we can continue it moving forward. Back to Captain Pickram. I, I know you've, you've been leading the wellness initiative at Tucson Police Department. Um, for a while now. On your side, you know, so Matt's talking about, you know, services that are, you know, available for his, you know, EMS folks. How does that look for you and your your law enforcement um, uh, peers? Um, one of the things I do want to point out is um, one of the things we recognize in Tucson as a whole is that we are stronger together. So a lot of the things that we do, we include our public safety partners uh, with fire and communications. I like to say I kind of drag them into almost anything that we've got going on. So we've had um, suicide awareness for law enforcement. Uh, that training came through in, in, in January, February, March. They have different levels. They start with the chiefs and they go down to train the trainers, line officers. But we invite the other public safety partners to, the, to, to that training as well. Um, and and one of the things that I think is 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 most important, and, and Matt um, kind of alluding to something that he said, um, it starts at the top. Like people will ask me uh, about wellness, and I and they want to start a a wellness unit, and I will say, well, how does your how does your boss feel about wellness? And I've gotten well, it's their job, so you know they're on board. And I will tell them that if your mouth is saying wellness is important, and your actions are saying it not so much. That is what your employees will, will will recognize. I can tell you Chief Kazmar lives it. Um, we have uh, bought into the Struggle Well, Boulder Crest Struggle Well program. Um, he opens up every one of those. And there's a, a point in there where they talk about disclosure. And he talks about um, when his father passed and, and how that affected him. But he is constantly talking to the department and other people about how important wellness is. And so I can tell you that our employees feel that. I can tell you that Sharon at communications, they are the same way. And I can tell you at the fire department, they are the same way. So um, we, we've kind of combined together to, um, to, to kind of support each other in any wellness endeavors that we have going on. Again, we bought Safe, uh, Safe LEO. We have COP line, which is a, a crisis line uh, specific to law enforcement personnel. Um, they've held trainings at our facilities on two or three different occasions. One of the things that um, came out several years ago with the, uh, the president's task force on 21st century policing, there was a wellness component in there, the sixth pillar. Um, and a lot of them talk about the need for yearly wellness checkups. But what's not covered in there is all of these things cost money. Where you're now saying you've got to go outside to a provider. Well, we're not we're not endless endless pools of money. Um, one of the things that we've done here is if we've as we've offered them time off to go on their own. So it is a voluntary thing. But the the things that we we struggle with is we've got a lot of good ideas. How do we put them into play? Where do we get the money for these things? Um, and again, that is where we find out because we are the largest agency, the police department is the largest agency. It's a lot 
easier for us to, to put on different things. But recognizing that fire might not have this resource. Um, I was speaking with one of the gentlemen, one of the captains over there that I work with a lot just yesterday. And I said, come to this training, look at it through the fire department eyes. And if it works for you, then you can make it part of yours or you're welcome to continue to come on board. Um, uh, but again, it starts at the top. Chief Kazmar will say, it is okay not to be okay. And he came in at a time where we actually um, had two suicides. He became chief in December. We had a suicide of a three-year officer in May and a suicide of a, a, I think she was right at 20 years as a sergeant um, who had a brother on the department, uh, ex-husband on the department, two kids very connected that hit hard. A year later, um, one of our retirees that he had worked with committed suicide. Um, so we were constantly looking at what can we do for our members. We've had suicide awareness training um, when the economy uh, was 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 struggling in 2010, um, and a lot of people were foreclosing on their houses. We went through took the entire department through suicide awareness right before COVID. We took the entire department through suicide awareness. We already have plans next year to take the department through suicide awareness again, as well as alcohol abuse. Uh, we have a we have a psychologist on staff, Dr. Cornell, and if she's starting to see patterns, okay, where can we plug in things that to kind of offset some of those things? But I the the, the bottom line for me is it it has to come from the top. You have to have um, your, your, your command staff willing to say, this is not anything to be ashamed of. There's no stigma attached. If you ask for help, um, we're going to provide help to you. And I, I believe that, again, um, police, fire, and communications here, I believe we, that we have that because we all have uh, uh, chiefs at the top or directors at the top that that is what they tell you. And you know that they're not, it is not just something that they're saying. It is it's something that they put into act. They put policies, they put um, training, procedures, um, communications, just got a, a master clinician about a year ago um, to, to help support them. We are in the process of, of hiring a, sec a master clinician here to uh, support Dr. Cornell. So we destigmatized, we tr as much as possible, we destigmatize, destigmatize it and I, you see it in our personnel. They are not afraid to ask for help. But at the same time, we have different ways that people can communicate and say, hey, I need to see, um, I need to get in with our behavioral sciences unit. Um, I, we have uh, our uh, QR codes that are placed throughout the department that they can just very quietly, whenever they want to, take that and say, I'd like to get in and they will contact and no one else will know. So we, 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 Take the confidentiality and seriously because everybody doesn't want to to know everyone to know that they may be seeking help. But at the same time, we make it okay whether you want somebody to know or not that it is okay to seek help. Um, you know, she's right. Starting at the top is what matters. And you know, for a while, we you know there was kind of an attitude. Well, we're not special. We're just like everybody with the regular stuff. But we are special because we are um, we are exposed to things that are aren't normal. Our call takers take, you know, about 130 calls per shift of people screaming in their ear, wanting help, perhaps dying, perhaps being attacked. Um, and then sometimes they're just calling because they didn't know who else to call and they're calling about a non-emergent thing. And there is still that pressure that connects to that to say, let me get you off the phone in a polite way and get on to this next thing. But to Michelle's point, we have made so much, um, so many strides forward in part for multiple reasons. The leadership is the biggest component that says this is okay and this is what we're doing. The young generation coming into all of our workforces, though, are also bringing, they're bringing, when you say from the bottom up, absolutely, they are, this is normal to them. They, you know, I've had people even during their interview process say, what do you, what do you guys do for mental health for your employees? Just ask us right out. Like you wouldn't have heard that years ago. And I, you know, I'm with the chief on, on his comments years ago. That was just something we just, you wouldn't think of asking. We were all tough and we were all going to show up and do our job. But lots of efforts in place. Um, the Struggle Well program has, we've been invited to that by TPD and we join in with them, sharing some stories back and forth. 
a big focus there is that, you know, it's it, it's okay to struggle. We're just going to help you struggle well. We're not going to tell you you're not going to struggle. And I think that's so key to all of this. This is normal. You're going to struggle. Here's how to be a little healthier about it. From all of that, we've, we've come away with a gratitude tree in our in our center. And when one of my folks asked, can we put up a gratitude tree? I thought, okay, sure, that'll be a phase. That thing, we have a forest on the wall now where people come in and they write a little note, you know, so-and-so did this really nice thing for me today, or they made me feel better about, about this. And that thing has grown. It's a forest, it's a garden, they're coming down from the clouds, there's butterflies, the whole, the whole wall, I'll send you a picture. Um, we have a sensory room where people could go into a room that's, you know, it's got, um, it's got brain therapy, light therapy, um, aromas and sour candy to disrupt your thought pattern, get you back into something normal, quiet, just a moment of quiet, a weighted blanket. It's got all the things that allow your body to just kind of decompress after a tough call. We have a wellness center because we believe physical health, it directly correlates to your mental health and um, so we built this beautiful, what we would call a gym, but we, we, for all the right reasons, call it a wellness center, but it wasn't getting used until we added things like peer fitness trainers, um, and a wellness break. So you can go during our time because we think it's that important or we'll, we'll pay you to go into the gym and, and, and take care of yourself. Uh, as Michelle mentioned, we got an, an in-house clinician. And we had a really good feeling that she would be really busy, and she is very busy. People see her all the time. And what we find is that while our, our work is often the tipping point, the biggest issues are the regular stuff that you hear in regular society. It's just that we added this extra layer of difficulty on top of it that created that tipping point. We just put in a, um, a, a product called MindBase. It's a, it's a, it's a app that automatically alerts us that, hey, this person has dealt with five CPR calls in the last three days. Check in with them. It allows that person also to check in with themselves and you know, kind of find those resources that are plugged in, QR codes, just like Michelle was talking about. That makes it really simple. They don't have to try to remember a phone number or what was, what was the process I was supposed to take. As we hear, hear from Amy Dev as often as there's no wrong door and there is value in that thought process. It says, whichever way you want to find some help, we'll get you there. The, the uh, three-year police officer that Michelle referred to as well was a, was a dispatcher for us prior to being a police officer. And so when those events happen, not just because he worked here, but because they're part of our public safety family, they affect all of us. Mm. And we feel that grief, even when we have, you know, just a, a recent news story of a person uh, who passed away based on a domestic violence incident. You know, we took the, those calls and now we get to hear this outcome and there's pain in the room and there's heaviness in the room. And even we we have a few staff who have lived with those types of situations in their own life. And now it all comes flooding back because of this new incident that just happened. Um, so this constant, you know, interception of things that is affecting us the recognition, the normalization of it, the um, the no wrong door approach and the multifaceted and not everybody wants to manage their issues the same way. And we have to have different ways, generationally, um, just personality wise. I don't relate well with this avenue, but I, I have this other thing I can use. Um, and then one thing Michelle didn't talk about, which I'm a little surprised, they put on an amazing conference this past year and they're putting on another one. Um, and it was all centered on employee wellness and behavioral health. Incredible job that she did with, along with, we had a little bit of, we, we added a little bit to it, but not as much as we should have. And um, Tucson Fire, I know, joined in, joined forces with Tucson Police and put together an amazing conference with incredible attendance across the city, across the state, with people from out of state attend. And it really just begins to say to everyone, this is important to us, top to bottom, bottom to top. Um, and this is this is the wave of the future. We're not going to just, you know, allow these things to kind of slide backwards and go back into a, a an area of ignorance. We're going to really prioritize these efforts moving forward. I'm curious if from your perspective, Dr. Bradley, if there is a role for medical directors across the state to play in, in responder wellness. 
You know, it's a it's a fine line, and I think part of that is um, as a medical director, you want to make sure that you are really maintaining kind of a little bit of separate separation between kind of employee health and kind of your oversight as medical direction. That being said, what you can do is be very supportive of the process. And I think that's the role of medical direction is to really say, we fully support the importance of wellness programs because we recognize that when people struggle, it affects their ability to do their job and provide good care. Uh, and I think just again, raising that awareness, being open and upfront about it as an emergency and EMS physician, uh, similarly, I see many of the, the tough situations that are seen in the pre-hospital setting. And so those same things affect us. And so I think recognizing as a medical director that our role is to really embrace this and to uh, kind of talk about this again, and eliminating some of that stigma. And as we make our initial descent into the end of our conversation, I want to make sure to put out, you know, I think it's too early and, and probably a hard thing from a metric perspective, you know, to talk about as far as outcomes. But I'm curious if anybody on the panel, you know, has something from an outcomes perspective that, you know, comes to the top of your mind. What I could say, uh, at least from what we've seen so far, is that uh, we've had a few few staff who have had to go on FMLA for mental health issues, and they've come back stronger, uh, and they've come back happier, and they and the fact that they've come back at all is probably not something that would have happened. Uh, even three or four years ago, they probably just would have found another job. They would have resigned and found another job. So, um, I, you know, I think that's a great outcome. You know, to me, like, I, I'm just happy to see that it's being used and that people are coming back with positive experiences and they're sharing those experiences with, with their other coworkers um, to get them involved as well if they're not already. Yeah, a couple of things, you know, we really started, uh, we we're all about, you know, capturing benchmarks and saying, hey, is this working and doing us any good? Do we need to rethink it, restart? Um, and we started down the road of leave use and said, well, healthier employers will come to, to work more regularly. They'll, they'll use leave less. And yet what we're finding is, no, they're using it about the same. They're just using it for more healthy reasons. They're not using it because they're overwhelmed. They're using it because they're trying to achieve life balance and we're making that okay. And we're saying, great, you should do that. You know what, I'm calling in because I need this day off, it's my son's birthday. And rather than being at work and stressed out about you know this torn part of me, I'm gonna take the day off for my son's birthday. And we embrace that and we go, good, high five, um, we'll get you covered. Or they'll help us get themselves covered. So we started down that road thinking leave use would be, you know, an indicator and we have backed off of that. But what we're what we're going for now is more of a, we're doing kind of a, a, a biannual survey just saying, how do you feel about work? How's your life balance? How, you know, what's your general level of, of happiness? Michelle touched a little bit on um, an annual review. FIRE does one in their annual physicals that says, hey, how are you feeling? And it's kind of a, a depression assessment and it's, um, how do you feel about life assessment? In the olden days, when they first put that in, we all just went, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, all the way down that list, no depression, no problems, no anything. And I think they're having a shift that says, actually, you know, here's where I was last year. Here's here's the help I'm getting. And yes, I'd like more information about, you know, resources and whatnot. So I think it's just such a tough one. And part of it is what, what the chief just said there is, you know, our ability to know who's involved and who isn't. And, and the fact that we don't know that allows us to build trust that we increase the use of it. So I think an increased use is a good indicator that people are getting healthier or at least pursuing that, that level of health. So that, yeah, I think that was an interesting one for all of us. We thought, oh, well, just these will be our measurables, but this one's a little, a little different to measure than, than kind of anything we have faced before. Uh, from our standpoint, uh, we uh, again, we did the incentive-based wellness checks with a, a physician and uh, a mental health clinician. Um, that actually turned out better than we thought. Um, and and um, we don't, again, we don't know what comes out of that, but the fact that somebody is actually volunteering to to go, um, we I figured that we'd probably have more people who would do the physical checks up, checkups, but we actually had more people who ended up doing the mental health checkups on, on that end. But I can tell you, um, even though it's not really anything to measure, we've had three line of duty deaths uh, on the department since I've been here, um, with the last one uh, occurring um, on Easter Sunday of this this past year. 
just how our employees interacted with each other at the funeral or at the at the um, OME or um, during the service and afterwards, um, taking care of each other. Uh, we actually had one sergeant reach out and said, hey, I think, uh, can we use this facility to get this group of people together for a decompression day? So, you know, we are seeing be because it is at the top um, and it, it, it's coming all the way down, the employees are feeling safe and secure about suggesting some of these things and taking some of these actions on themselves. Uh, it's not, again, not anything that you probably can measure, but it is something that we are seeing that there is a culture change uh, where wellness is, is concerned. And like Sharon says, you know, they're, they're taking their leave. When we check in on them um, for uh, the, the early intervention, when we check in for that, we're, it, it's not a punitive thing. We just want to make certain that we're hitting all the notes. Like, is there something that we can help you with? Or is this because my wife just had a baby? Um, you know, babies cry at night. I don't get a lot of sleep, so I'm taking the time off. Or is it, I've got a sick parent and I don't know what to do? I think one of the things when you look at this is it's tough to measure this, right? So we often don't know what percent of our workforce are struggling. I, To me, the biggest sign of success is when you see individuals who talk about hey, I used our department's program and they're willing to actually talk about that and share the messaging and how it's helped them. And I think I hear that kind of becoming a more common experience where you see individuals across the state that are more open and honest to say, I utilized our department's resources uh, and this is what I got out of that. And I want to help other people by sharing the message. To me, that's probably one of the best signs of success because they've identified that they've gotten help from that but it also helps other people realize that it's okay to talk about this and ask for help. So I think to me, to measure this is gonna be really tough. Uh, the goal is hopefully just to keep normalizing this, uh, normalizing that it's okay to get help and then seeing people share that they've actually asked for help and utilize the resources. So we're, we're discussing some things that are pretty you know, mature. You've all you know, gotten your policies and your procedures and your programs and your funding to a pretty mature point. But as a final point, does anything come to your mind that you would want to share with an agency or an organization across the state that hasn't started tackling these topics like you each have? Is there something that you would say to you know local leadership, whether elected or if you're working with a board like you know Matt's organization? Is there something that you would share with these communities to say, hey, this is this is why you should do this work to support your public safety professionals in your community? I think the simplest answer is it's the right thing to do, and I think we all inherently know that. But I think it's a it's it's a, an it's hard to recruit quality people, and and I think today's generation is looking for those things. You can't just say we want women here and say we don't have a pregnancy policy. You can't say we care about employees and and then say well we don't really have anything formal, but we don't but we care about you. And I think our ability to show them that makes us a more attractive employer. And it makes it a healthier workplace. In a healthier workplace, their productivity is different. That's all. We're, we're kinder to people because we're dealing with our own stuff in a more healthy way. And we're providing better customer service because we're healthier employees. So I think those are the selling points. If we look at what employers are facing when people are walking out the door, the loss of money and the loss of investment when a person walks out the door because they are not well and healthy or dissatisfied in some way, and we just fail to even ask them when we go, yeah, next, and we plug them in. Certainly in fire EMS and policing and combo, we put a lot of training to someone before they even step out into the street that day. So that's a huge investment, even financially, that we've lost. Um, so sometimes that is, those are some key terms to uh, get people, but really the, it's the right thing to do. We, we know it inherently. We just have to you know, find ways to make it happen. Even with the wellness programs, um, it can be daunting in, in the beginning and, and just keep at it with small things. I, I mentioned that we had the wellness checks. We started that in October of last year. It is something that we started working on in 2019. But, you know, we, we have to go through so many things, um, you know, with your city or, 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 you know, all these other, there's all these other factors that come in that can well, what about this? Well, what about this? And so you just, it, you have to just kind of take bite-sized pieces and you have so many employees. We all have employees that I'm, I'm always amazed at what is walking around my building at any given time. Um, one of the, the beauties of the Struggle Well program is on Friday, 
the the students who have gone through the to the class they give suggestions on what they would like to see or the things that they want and we have tried to incorporate a lot of those in one of there's there's one session where they talk about your rucksack and your rucksack is full and the things that you put in your rucksack and that resonated so much with one of with one of the the attendees that he built a rucksack garden um on the side of our building and 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 it's just when when you have somebody that 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 gets it or or you know when it really hits them they go different places and and he he went to different places to get the rocks and the lady was like well what do you need the rocks for and he starts talking to her about the struggle well program and she tells him about struggling with drugs and alcohol when we can make certain that our employees are healthy it has a domino effect it goes out into the community and the people that we deal with it's a domino effect i think uh you know, at my level, uh, I'm I'm a. It just makes sense. That's why we should do it, right? Like it's the right thing to do. Uh, for the levels above me, <laughs> they're they're more dollars and and cents, right? Like they're the ones that actually have to pay the bill. And so the argument we make is, you know, people are going to stay longer. Hopefully, you know, we pour like like in any any EMS system, we pour tons of training dollars into our into our folks. Uh, and there's a huge burden every time one of them, a huge financial burden every time one of them leaves because we have to go through that whole process again. So the more we can we can retain our staff, the better. Financially, that's better. The the more mentally healthy they are, they're probably providing better care to our patients, which is better. I like that. Our medical director likes that. Uh, and so so for me, those are the arguments that that we make. When you have healthy providers, the citizens in the state are well served. The citizens in your community are well served, and so as an agency or entity uh, for people who maybe aren't buying into this to recognize if you keep your providers healthy, it's going to serve everyone well. Absolutely. I mean, I hear that echoed throughout the conversations that we have, you know, from the perspective of serving individuals in crisis, or if it's serving folks who are within our agencies, I think the web that connects each of us mm. that supports our ultimate outcome. And, you know, to Sharon's point about, you know, a balance. I think those in public safety, our balance is always going to be a little strange between work and life. This is, you know, this is a, a profession that requires a lot from us. Um, and so as leaders across the state continue to do the work that you do, I'm hopeful. Um, I agree with you all about outcomes, but the culture of our organizations in the public safety realm uh, are shifting palpably. And it's so wonderful to see that. And so thank you each for joining us today. Uh, I really, really appreciate your time, your expertise, and your enthusiasm for continuing this work as well. So thank you so very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Yes. You bet. Bye.